South Asia, the beautiful lectures on Chinese art and furniture. There's another dimension that he also has. Uh, in 2013, John discovered Malay textiles and has been passionately been collecting them. Believe me or not, he has now over 4,000 pieces and has given lectures on his collection in Malaysia, Singapore and Netherlands. So we are lucky to have him here and we will witness some of his collection outside. Later on, perhaps after the event, we'll have a uh, 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 yeah, briefing and whatnot outside you know, about the collection as well. Okay, from March to August 2019, this year alone, John, John organized a comprehensive and successful exhibition and seminar on Malay Kalinka embroidery um, at the Trangano State Museum. Those who have been uh, there, uh, perhaps, uh, should uh, recall all the interesting uh, and, and beautiful collection of his, of his uh, items you know, at the museum. In 2018, John decided to devote his life to the research and collective of Malay textile and moved to Kuala Lumpur to facilitate his mission. He hopes to write uh, a book on textile and Malay world and find a good museum in Malaysia to house and show his collection for benefit of all. So perhaps this exhibition of small collection is a smart uh, at UKM and perhaps we can negotiate more for a bigger exhibition later on. And um, this is about uh, John and some of you who are friends of John. Uh, thank you for coming here for your support and for the, for the rest also. Thank you for coming for your uh, interest uh, to listen to John's uh, speech. So please welcome Mr. John Hang. Assalamualaikum. Selamat pagi to everybody and thank you for coming. Uh, today, um, I'm very excited to share a lot of my discoveries um, of my collecting of batiks from the Malay world. Uh, actually, I started collecting uh, only recently in 2014, uh, not about uh, five years ago. Uh, but I've been buying textiles uh, from different parts of the world, mostly Malay textiles at a very rapid rate. And after uh, buying these textiles, I put them together and I saw certain patterns occurring uh, that uh, revealed many things about uh, the Malay world which I had not known before. So I'd like to share these discoveries. Um, so let's go to the first slide. Textiles of the Malay world and batiks of the Malay world, before we go into that, we have to understand who are the Malays. Um, we know um, in, uh, uh, in the middle of the century, um, there was Peter Bellwood who, was, who postulated the theory of the Malay uh, people coming from the Austronesian group of people from Taiwan. Uh, since then, it has been disputed and Oppenheimer has uh, a new theory about the Malays coming from Southeast Asia from a big land mass that was divided by flooding. So before, Borneo and the Malay Peninsula uh, and Sumatra was all one land mass and after flooding, it separated the people. Uh, but they were all interconnected. So they came from the Austronesian uh, group of people and later um, moved up to the coastlands and developed their own culture uh, stemming from the Hindu Buddhist culture and later developed into uh, Malay Muslim culture. So the Malay world um, is uh, actually a controversial topic uh, in terms of its periphery. Uh, what are the countries involved in the Malay world? Um, when uh, I grew up in Singapore, I studied under the British system in Singapore. And to me, the Malay world was Malaysia. And I think that was the purpose of the education then. Uh, when the British and the Dutch uh, separated uh, Malaysia and Indonesia in the Anglo-Dutch uh, Treaty in 1824, um, they were, um, it was pertinent that they promoted 
a Malay culture stemming from the 15th century uh, development of Malacca. And this went well with the Malay royalty in the Malay Peninsula, so that most people forgot their roots, the Malay roots stemming from the Sri Vijaya Empire and the Malayu Kingdom of Jambi, Sri Vijaya of Palemba. These were the earlier Malay civilizations. And so most people um, uh, believe their culture starting, uh, started from uh, Malacca. Um, later, uh, it's only recently uh, when Malaysia and Singapore, after being nationalized and the economy and political system being more stable, that uh, historians are delving into the earlier history. So there's a recent book in Singapore, 700 Years of Singapore, uh, talking, uh, having references from uh, much uh, earlier sources than the British sources, talking about the Malay world that incorporates Sumatra and Jambi, uh, even Aceh. Um, yes, Aceh, how is that related to the Malay world? Remember Raja Bongsu, how he was uh, captured by the Achenese and he married. They were so into connecting with the Malay world that they uh, convinced him to marry um, uh, the daughter of the Sultan. So a lot of the connections came from intermarriage. Um, as you can see um, here, uh, Aceh is up here. So the north of Sumatra belongs to the Malay world and then later uh, we, we, we realize here I have Cambodia uh, and Vietnam, South Vietnam, connected to the Malay world, and this is because of the Cham Malays. Um, the study of the Cham civilization did not start until the late 19th century uh, by the French, because after they conquered Vietnam or they occupied Vietnam, they realized that the uh, Divets, the Vietnamese people, were trying to. Uh, alienate the Champa people. And they decided there was no study about Champa civilization. They started Institute of Studies for the Champs. But it was only until 1990s that the British started studying about the relationships between the Champa people and the Malay people. And they realized that the connection was very close and intimate. Uh, for example, in um, the 19th century, when the Divets uh, attacked um, the charms, the Sultan of Kelantan sent troops up to help. They were very well connected in that way. And even in Kelantan, uh, I think the airport is called Pengkelan Jetu, right? Uh, the port of Champa. So when you go to Trenganu and Kelantan and Naratiwat, there are many kampongs with Cham people there. And they look exactly like Malay people, they speak Malay language. And I went to some of the villages in Vietnam, and it was a complete Malayu Kampong, where people spoke Malay and dressed exactly like the people in Kelantan. And as you go further, you can see in the Philippines, in fact, Raffles in his uh, book History of Java already said that the South of Philippines is included in the Malay world. And uh, if you read the history of uh, Sulu Island here and uh, Magmina now, the early sultans were the Arab Malays from Johor. And also in Brunei, the court was connected to Johor. And later, the, the uh, Sultan Tengah married into the Sambas and Manpower families and created the Malay kingdoms in the coast of Borneo. And because the Bugis and the Malays were well assimilated in, in uh, the late 16th century, many Malays, Malay people uh, escaping from the Portuguese invasion went to Makassar and set up a Kampong Malayu in Makassar and we know a lot of Bugis in 1699 uh, uh, escaped escaped to uh, the Real Islands and later from the Real Islands uh, the Bugis went to sorry went to the uh, coast, the west coast of Kalimantan. So all this here is my periphery of the Malay world as I saw the connection in textiles. Okay. So when I talk about the Malay world and the Malays of the Malay world, it's not just from the Malay Peninsula and from Sabah and Sarawak, but from the whole 
um, Malay world that you see here. So, even today, uh, the Malay world, who belongs to the Malay world is disputed. The Filipinos who, of Luzon, who are now Catholics, uh, believe that they are part of the Malay world still. Uh, but uh, most uh, Malays consider a Malay as someone who is uh, adopting um, Malay customs and also religion. Uh, here you see uh, the regions. I, I think I, I gave you all uh, a printout of this so you don't have to look at it. Uh, but these, you can go home and investigate all the different countries that I've included in the Malay world. So what is Malay Batik? I've divided it into four categories. Uh, it's Batiks made by Malays for Malay people. Second, it's Batiks made by others for the Malays. So you'd be surprised that many people made batiks for the Malays. In fact, uh, only one quarter of Malay batiks were made in Malaysia. The other quarter was made in Sumatra, especially in South Sumatra, in Jambi, and Bengkulu, in west, southwest Sumatra. And then a big portion, 50% of batiks of the Malays were made in Java. Okay. Uh, so it's made by others for the Malays. Uh, here you have batiks uh, made for others that the Malays also favoured. So you have um, different product, uh, producers of uh, batiks. You have the Indo-Europeans, you have the Chinese, Peranakans, and you have the Arab, Indo-Arabs. So there was a big Arab community in Krabya in North Pakalungan that made batiks for the Malay people and also for the Indo-Europeans. And the Palikalangan Malay, uh, Chinese people, when they made Peranakan batiks, it happens that the Malays liked some of them. It was not made for the Malays, but the Malays bought a lot of them because they liked the color scheme. Uh, we'll go through detail of, details of that later. Um, and then we have, sorry. Uh, imitation batiks. Um, there were many imitation batiks made for the Malay mass market in Malaysia, in Thailand, in Japan, and in Europe. And we'll go through those later. Uh, so you can see you have batiks uh, made for the Malays, by the Malays in the Malay Peninsula, and then in Sumatra as a quarter, and the coastal islands, and then half was made by the Javanese for the Malay market. And now we have batiks. I have, uh, this talk is quite long, so I made it more simple by dividing it to three major sections. So I hope you can follow me. The first section is batiks by region. Okay. So you have several regions that I talked about just now, Sumatra, Malaysia, and Java. Okay. Then batiks by types. We have different types of batiks, like batik wayangkuli, batik kosong, batik basurak, okay? And then batiks by color. So these are the regions. In the Malay Peninsula, most of the batiks were produced uh, in uh, the north of Malaysia and includes some of the southern Thai uh, provinces, uh, such as Songkla, Naratiwa, and Patani. And then in Sumatra, it's mainly Jambi, Mankulu, some in Aceh, now they make some in Berito and Bintan. And in Java, uh, those are the many places they made them. So now we go to, by region, to the Malay Peninsula. And we can see in this map, uh, this is from Matunku's book, uh, your map showing the different places in Malaysia that made batiks. And you can see here, um, most of the dots here, the brown dots, represent the batik ateliers in Malaysia. And there's nothing in Pahang or Johor or, or Nibri in Milan, but you see a few around Kuala Lumpur in Selangor. And uh, so the, there are only three states that produce batik. Okay? 
and mostly in Kelantan and Tringan. And what kind of batiks do they produce? The, the batiks that we see today, for example, Professor Salma, she's wearing a beautiful batik tulis, uh, produced in Malaysia, probably uh, in uh, Kelantan or Tringan. And you can see it's a batik tulis. And how is batik to this done? Is by a canting uh, uh, batik wax pen, where they put the wax here and draw the outlines. It's very different from the batik to this of Indonesia. This is where the outlines are drawn, and then the colors are painted, painted between the outlines, and then when it's um, it's dyed, the outlines will become white. Okay. And you, be, uh, you get very uh, pretty and beautiful batik tulis such as these. And in um, uh, fashion shows, you can see the traditional Malay batik kurong and the uh, contemporary men's shirt in batik tulis like this. And in the kampongs, you can see this kind of sorry, uh, this kind of uh, batiks. Uh, batik tulis, this was purchased in Kraft Tana in Kuala Lumpur. What came before batik tulis? Batik chap. Okay. So uh, the history of Malay batiks actually only started in 1920s. Uh, when batik chap uh, started, it was brought by some Javanese uh, uh, workmen. Uh, I think there's a Rad Radan Mako. He came to uh, Kelantan, Kota Baru, and it was um, an entrepreneur. His name was uh, Haji Jesh Su. He invited him to teach them the batik uh, chop. And batik chop started in Indonesia in 1850, uh, when there was a huge demand uh, from international buyers and from local buyers for batiks. And sometimes for the hand-painted batiks in those days, it takes a month to produce, and they found out that by using batik chop, just doing the chops, they could produce 20 a day, 20 batiks a day. So there's a big difference. And so they could satisfy the market. So when the Malaysians heard of this batik, they asked the Japanese to come over to teach them how to do the production. And this is how it's done. The chops are done in the wax, and then they were printed onto the cloth, and then put in the dye. And this is the result. These are um, about 1960s, these batiks. You can tell by the color scheme they have. Uh, and this I found on the clothes lines hanging in Tringanu in my last visit to Tringanu. So maybe some grandmother was hanging her old batiks. You can see the holes here. Uh, but this is the traditional batik done in batik chop. OK, see it's from Tringanu, you can see. Um, and what came before batik chop? So the tradition of batik in Indonesia is uh, several hundred years, but in Malaysia, the batik started from actually pelangi, which is tie-dye. Um, when they wanted to tie-dye the patterns, they used a wooden block. They carved a wooden block into the pattern they wanted, and they put it on a, a red coloring, and they stamped it on the cloth, and they used a needle and thread to stitch the outlines and then they would dye, and then you have this zigzag pattern around the edges. That was the palangi that they made, uh, dependent on this wooden blocks. And this uh, uh, technique actually comes from India. Uh, in Tringano, they call it uh, batik tara or batik puku. In Kelantan, they call it batik puku. And the batik blocks were used in, uh, in the north all the way. I found in Songkla here, uh, uh, up here, number one, you can see in Songkla, the museum here, and in Naratiwat, and in Yala, Patani, they were all making batiks by blocks in the old days because I saw in the antique shops some of these old wooden blocks. And also, when I went to Sumatra, uh, and I went all the way to Daikinga here, in this island, in the museum there, I saw them using, I saw examples of wooden blocks. So here you can see uh, the batik blocks, uh, the way it's printed. Usually the cloth is a fine cotton cloth imported from India. 
and uh, you have the pattern, the picture here, you can see it's printed like this, uh, and it's quite, it's, it's not as halus as the copper blocks. So when I went to Narati, uh, Narati Wat in Songkla, I went all the way up to the Folklore Museum Institute uh, uh, of Southern Thailand, which is up here, you can see, and we had to cross this as the longest bridge in Thailand to get to an island uh, on the lake here, and um, it's a Koyo Island, and there you find a museum, it's the Folk Art Museum in the Thaksin University, and in there you see both uh, examples of the wood blocks and the copper blocks. So before the copper blocks came the wood blocks. So you will ask me, why do they call it batik when it's just wooden blocks printing onto the cloth? In the old days, they didn't really differentiate. They call batik for everything that looks like a print. So for us today, batik, you really need to use the wax to have the wax resist. But in the old days, these block batiks were also prints, block prints were also called batik. Okay, this is the style of batik. And when you look at it, it actually looks very much like the Kelantan Trigamu style that was influenced by the Indonesian performance style. And then when I went all the way south, just now it was all the way north in Thailand, I went all the way south to this, uh, this island, Daglinga, where the Malay Kingdom moved after Malacca and Johor. Um, I found a, a, the production of Blanc Batiks too. Uh, this is in the Chahaya Linga Museum in Pulau Linga. You see, this is from the museum, and this is the type of batik they did on the batik uh, Bajukuro from the woodblock batik. So could batik chak Kingano have been inspired by Indian woodblock prints on chins? Chins is a fine cotton. So in the old days in the Malay world, there was a lot of import of um, <coughs> Malay textiles, and Malacca was the center for this import. And later they sent it out to Trigano and Kalanta, and most of these textiles were wooden block prints on cloth, and these came from India. So I'm asking, could these wood blocks inspire the ones that were created in Trigano and Kalanta? And I think it is because uh, you can see this uh, piece here I found in Trigano, and I suspect it comes from India. It's a wood block print. Okay, so there were pieces that exist, there are still pieces that exist from the 18th and 19th century coming from India that may have inspired the woodblock prints of Tringali and Kalantan. And in the old days, they would call these batik kada, which is interesting because kada doesn't produce any. It's just that kada people bought a lot of them from Tringali and Kalantan. Uh, and you can see uh, there is a batik kada here is done with woodblock prints. Uh, because it's only one-sided. In batik, you have it on both sides. And it's very interesting because when you look at the pattern, it's actually the state symbol for Kelantan. Uh, Kada, sorry. And then here, uh, they forgot to carve it on the reverse. They carved it the right way around, so when they printed it, it was the ballet. Okay. So somebody said, why don't you turn the star on the other side? But there's nothing on the other side. So it's, uh, it's very interesting. So this um, was found online. I bought online. Um, it came, comes from Kada. But Kada didn't print this. They must have ordered it from either Kalanta or Trigano in the early days. So these are the blocks okay, that you see. This is the International Textile Museum in KL. And then from there, um, uh, the, the people who did these blocks were uh, Haji Tejsu in Kota Baru and in Kuala Trigano was Haji Ali. So these two entrepreneurs started the batik woodblock factories and then later they invited the Japanese and started the copper blocks and made a lot of money from this and today their company still exists. Okay, these are the early woodblocks from, uh, from Kelantan that now is in the National Museum in Singapore. This is also in the National Museum in Singapore, but they come from Kelantan. The early period of the 1930s and 40s. And then the later period maybe, uh, also 1930s and 40s, but um, maybe slightly later because the colors have become brighter. 
And then these are the 19, early 20th century, maybe 19, uh, 40s to 50s. And these are the later ones, 1980s to 2000. And these are the latest ones, but you can see it's for the Malay market. Because these are sapras. And what are sapras? The Malays will use it for makan, right? They put it on the floor. Uh, it's very dynamic in that uh, pattern. These are other examples of contemporary Tranganu batiks. And then you come, uh, you come across things like this. I posted this on Facebook and I had many people saying, John, you did, your posting is incorrect. This is not Malay Batik. This is Javanese because it's the Sawat pattern of Java. But uh, the thing is, many people do not know that in the old days, the Javanese patterns were the most popular here because they didn't have their own patterns in the old days. So what they did was they ordered uh, people to go to Java and buy up the blocks and bring it back to Trigano and Kalanta and they used the copper blocks. They didn't make their own before. They used the ones uh, from the antique shops in, in, in Java. And the reason why I say that this is not a Javanese is because the cotton feels very thin, unlike uh, and not as fine as the Javanese cotton. That's number one. And the pattern is slightly different. I checked all the sour patterns in Java. There's a slight difference and it's quite rough, the workmanship. Okay. So it, it, you have to see that there's a trend of using Indonesian textiles and appreciating uh, Indonesian textiles in Malaysia. So this proves, uh, this Baju Kulong from the 1930s uh, proves my fact because it's using uh, Batik Tiga Nigri from Surakarta. Okay, and it's made into a baju kurong. Now we know that the Javanese do not use baju kurong. It's typical of a Malay fashion. But they use Indonesian uh, batik instead of uh, Malay batik. This was printed and made in Indonesia and then cut up to make uh, a baju kurong in Malaysia. You can see the, uh, you know, the typical tulang balut here. Yeah? Uh, it's a teluk blanga baju kurong. Uh, and then I came across this batik. Uh, it was sold to me as a safra. Uh, it's the same size as these square safras, but it has a wire coolant figure of bima. And this figure, uh, when you look at it, you definitely say this is batik Indonesia. But look at the sign here. It says Yusuf Muhammad. So who is Yusuf Muhammad? Anybody knows? He is actually the son of Haji Chesu. And uh, it's Kota Bar, uh, from Kota Baru in Kelantan. So it, it puzzled me a lot because I said, in Kelantan, they have their own wayang kulit. So why don't they use their own wayang kulit? Oh, you know the difference, right? The wayang kulit in Kelantan is using the Thai a conical hat, not this Javani style headdress. But in those days, they appreciated Indonesian culture and batiks, so they used that uh, pattern. And you can see even today, when I went to Kraft Tangan in uh, Kelantan, I saw them selling uh, saputangans with the Indonesian prints. So I think they still have the old Indonesian blocks and they still use it. And I went to Kraft Tangan, uh, Kuala Lumpur two days ago, and they also sell these. And in the hotel here, um, the hotel in the Bangi Golf Course that I stayed, on the walls they have the Malaysian artists' batik work, but still using Indonesian Mayakulit rather than Kelantanese Mayakulit. So there is this cultural um, uh, appreciation, I would call, of Indonesian textiles. So can you see this is the difference? The Malaysian version and the Indonesian version. Okay. The Malaysian uh, wayang kulit, it has this conical hat. Okay. Whereas the, the Javanese one is more ornate on the sides. So then you have this problem coming up. 
in the last uh, Miss Malaysia contest, uh, the Indonesians were screaming and objecting to the use of their batik. Uh, but the thing is, they do not know that we appreciated their batiks from a long time ago. It has become that we have assimilated with the Indonesian batiks and it's part of our culture. They said, oh, the uh, Parangrusa, which is this pattern, is a um, very uh, sacred pattern only reserved for the royalty. But when you go to Indonesia, uh, everyone is wearing Parangrusa. It's a common uh, uh, batik now. It's not restricted to the court. So I do not see anything wrong with, I mean, she could be wearing a Cuban textile or Mexican textile, right? It, it, we, we, we share textiles with each other. Um, <coughs> And you have the same problem coming up in a recent uh, Mr. Malaysia show where people said that uh, the representative from Kuching, Sarawak, was using the, the Kalimantan uh, motifs. But the Kalimantan motifs also exist in Sarawak, you see. Um, so I'm, I'm saying that if you know the history of the whole of the Malay world, um, there is a huge repertoire to a, 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 a use in your patterns and designs. You're not restricted to this particular region. And now because of colonialism and nationalism, we become separated and we become like protective of these designs. When in, in the old days we shared with each other. And perhaps we can use this old example for thinking of how we can uh, coordinate with each other uh, in terms of international problems. For example, like the recent haze. You know, instead of refusing the help from the nations, we could say we are brothers. You know, we shared a common heritage before. Let's get together and solve this problem before it's too late. Um, so the next region we go to is in Sumatra, where we go to uh, most important area is Jambi and then Kulu. Okay. Uh, and where is Jambi? Uh, Jambi was in the old days called the Kingdom of Malay. Uh, how did we know that? Because in uh, 671, when I Ching, the monk, traveled there, uh, he recorded that he went to uh, the kingdom called Malay, and it was in a region above uh, Sri Vijaya, uh, above Palembang. And after that, he traveled to uh, uh, Kedah, and then later to Nalanda, India, to study uh, Buddhism. So we have early records in uh, Chinese history books about Jambi. Um, so what is, um, uh, why is Jambi producing batiks? Okay. Uh, I think it started um, in the late 18th century, early 19th century uh, with the Arabs. Uh, there was an Arab migration uh, from Yemen. There were many Hyderabad uh, Muslim Arabs that migrated uh, from uh, Arabia and Yemen to Singapore and Malaysia and to Sumatra. And the family that uh, arrived in Jambi in the 1830s was the El Jufri family. Okay? And uh, the family was made famous by um, Pengaran uh, Wijo Kusumo. Uh, he was made a prince by the Sultan uh, Nazaruddin uh, because he uh, was an Arab that was well uh, learned. Uh, he was well learned in Islam, and uh, he built a mosque. And they used, um, they employed him to be uh, the intermediary between the Dutch because Sultan Nazaruddin hated the Dutch, and he went up to the river to hide when the Dutch came to discuss business with them. So it was the Arabs who took over, and they became very rich from having business with the Dutch. In fact, uh, most of the houses that belonged to the Sultan were dilapidated, attack wooden houses that they called the Istana. But when you look at uh, uh, this uh, Arab house, uh, it's actually quite amazing because it, it's a mansion, a concrete mansion, uh, whereas the Sultan's palace is like this. This is. Uh, Sultan Taha is the son of Sultan Nasiruddin. Okay, so uh, his mansion is not far from the Batik workshops in Jambi. And uh, when I went to Palembang and the, to the museum there, they would look at the Batiks and they said, oh, 
Inipatik or Jufri. And I said, what's Batik or Jufri? So let's have a look. It's this town of Batik, which is uh, very Arabic in design, with these arabesque uh, floral patterns uh, that is still popular today. All these are Batik Basure. Uh, and the person who made the Al Jufri family famous was Idris uh, Al Jufri. Uh, he, um, his son also married the daughter of the Sultan, and he became the richest man in Jambi. And I think it's because of that they were able to order their own batiks. But their batiks became so popular that besides the Arabs, the Malays also loved it. It became prestigious to wear a batik Al Jufri. So they would be not enough produced in Jambi, and they would order it from Chiribon, and they would send patterns to Lassem to make. So many of these are made in Lassem. The Lassem ones look a bit orange, red in color, because the acidity of the water in Lassem is different from that in Jambi. The Jambi reds are more purplish red, whereas the Lassem is orange red. This is also Batik Al Jufri. It's very fine uh, Batik work uh, where actually the animals are there. You can see little birds, but they're not exactly that recognizable as animals. And I think this is because it's for the Muslim market. And this we call uh, Kudung. In Sumatra, they call it Kudung. Here we call it a Tudung. Okay, you can tell because of the edge here, they call the sisir or the hair. And a Selena would what we want with a uh, uh, Robong. The uh, uh, tudong is one with uh, the stisir, and the sarong is one that has the pachirobong in the center. So this is a kudong, okay? also al -jufri. and this is another kudong. And the format comes from Indian textiles, because in Sumatra, there were many Indian textiles imported there. So there is the two schools of thought. Because Sumatran batiks were not really uh, discovered until the 1980s when um, Fiona Kerelot from uh, Hunt University uh, did her PhD thesis on it, stating that Sumatra had an independent batik production uh, aside from Java. And uh, she showed that the, the textiles are quite different, and batik al Jufri is one type of Sumatran textiles from, uh, from Jambi. And this is how I would assume that the, the Arab uh, Malays would be dressed in Jambi because uh, they were very simple and elegant. And this is the Batik al Jufri, Selendang, and, and Sarong with the Baju Panjang. Okay. And in general, uh, Jambi Batiks, you can see, have their own characteristic. This is a batik kudung basida. Basida means to get together. So the women, when they get together in the mosque, they will wear this kind of head shawl. And probably it comes from an Indian uh, tradition. Uh, these are imported Indian textiles that were found in Sumatra. And they have the batik kalengan, which is the blue and white batiks, um, mostly geometric patterns. You develop from Indian textiles. And it's a beautiful piece, uh, Batik Bangbiru, uh, Batik Kalingan, sorry, or Batik Biru. And this is Batik Kalingan. And it's called, the pattern is called Batangari. It's from the river Batangari. And the pattern comes from Indian Tree of Life pattern. You can see here the Tree of Life. And here you have actually uh, found in Jambi. But I think this batik is from Lassem. It's called Bangbangan, Batik Bangbangan. And this is another Batik Bangbangan, uh, Baju uh, Panjang. And this is a Batik Bangbiru, blue and red. It's a kudong with the Basidang pattern. This is another one. They're quite rare nowadays. And here is the Buna Jato. It's a traditional uh, batik used for weddings because before the wedding, uh, the bride's friends would go to the garden and collect all the bunga jato and bring to a room to make a room more fragrant. Uh, this is the tradition that they, they told me in Jambi. And these are other patterns of Jambi batiks. 
and a lot of these copied the Kalin Sambagi from India. And this is a very interesting one with, uh, again, you cannot figure out whether it's a fish or not, but I think you can see some fish tail here, but the head is not that clear. It could be a carp. Okay, on, and uh, one way of distinguishing what is Sumatran batiks as opposed to Javanese batiks is uh, it's called batik sisihan, meaning that the the right and the left sides are different. Can you see? So uh, Hans Herringer, Rens Herringer from uh, Holland, when she lived in Java, she found out from the Malay women living in Sumatra that the way they use these uh, kain pajam uh, as sarongs is the young ladies, before they got married, would wrap the sarong in such a way that the red is in front, and then when they got married, is the dark side is in front. So it, it, it shows whether you are married or not. So this is a tradition of the Malay people in Sumatra. And this is a popular but rare motif. I found this in the Jambi Museum. It is called uh, Batik Kapal Sana. Also Batik Bangiru in terms of color. And these are, you can see the Batik Sisihan, red and blue. And another interesting Jambi Batik, which you will see in the exhibition, I use it as a salam, salendam, is the Batik Chili Padi. You see all these little Chili Padis. And also this is a Sisihan. This is for, uh, one side is for the younger woman and the other side is for the older woman. And another interesting Batik I found in Jambi is the Batik Kosong. Have you ever seen batiks like this? Where the center field is completely empty. I thought this was very interesting. And I wonder, because the design is so strong, if there was a specific meaning to this kind of batik, where nothing is put in the center. So I think it may relate to the Kai Lima Basong Kit in um, Palembang. They have a specific kind of Kai Lima where the center field is empty and it's actually green. And according to many books in Malay, in Sumatra, and in English research books, I found that they, they, they interviewed local people and they said these were used by widows who want to get married, to get remarried. So they are shy to tell the men they like they want to get remarried. They wear a Selenda Kosong in the center that's green. And the purple one is for a, a, a widow that's already getting married. And I'm not sure what the yellow one is because there are three colors. But in India, the saris with a yellow empty field is usually for weddings. Okay? So uh, it's a ceremonial kind of textile. And I'm, I'm wondering if the batiks with the empty centers relate to the limas and could have been used by widows. Janda uh, Baras. They call it. Yes. 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 So this is how it was worn. It's quite elegant. And then they have Batik Basurek or Basurat, uh, where they use uh, Arabic script to make the pattern. And this is a modern piece uh, and made for hanging for wedding day. And for the blue and white ones, this UC used for uh, the tutuk karanda for the cops, okay, for funerals. And then out, outside Jambi, uh, in on the islands, for example, in Tanjung Pinang in Bintan Island, uh, south of Singapore, here, Singapore is here. You know, when I traveled here, it was the first time I realized the Malay world outside Singapore. When I told a lot of my friends that I'm going to uh, Riau, they say, where is Riau? It's because in the Singapore educational system, they wanted to step up the Indonesian side of the Malay world. And um, lately, only that many people are traveling to Bintan uh, because now it's a resort for Singaporeans. But the historical area is in the south. And here in Tanjung Pinang, they have Kota Tanjung Pinang, in the port, they have a sculpture of a uh, seafood, which they call gong gong there. A shellfish. Every night when you go there, your friends in Tanjung Pinang will invite you to have gong gong for dinner. And all the batiks have this gong gong on it. 
another Batikongo. Uh, and then in Belitong, they also have batiks, but I think they haven't come up with their own specific identity, whereas in Tanjung Pinang they have. Um, then from there we go to um, Batik Java from the Sumatra market. And then from last time you have Batik Bambiru, Bambangan, which is red and cream. This Batik Bangan, Bangan, not used by the Javanese, but for the Malays. Batik Kalingan, this pattern, all the blue and whites. This one with airplanes, which is quite interesting. Um, the Malays in Sumatra love all these modern patterns. Sometimes you have airplanes, sometimes you have uh, cars, uh, umbrellas, and things like that. Um, Batik Pangbiru, which is red and blue and cream. This is Batik Pangbiru's Sisihan, you can see both sides are different. And I think this is made in Batam. Batam is famous for making batiks with animals, but you cannot actually see the animals because it's a very conservative Muslim place. So um, they made batiks for the Sumatran market as well. And it's also batiks in Sihan. Both sides are different. And I found this piece in Turkey, a uh, nice uh, 1900s to 1920 early batik, very fine. Uh, batik uh, Bambiru for the Sumatra market. And these are other examples, Bambiru, Bambiru. And for the European market, uh, the Europeans also made bat Batik Bambiru, but the Malays love them. We found a lot in Sumatra, this style. See, this is very Art Nouveau, European style, that was found in Malay Kampong in Sumatra. So they appreciated this uh, European style, but it was not specifically made for them. Okay. This is also a European style batik. And this as well. So there was a big Indo-European community in Java that made batiks, and they tried to sell it to all kinds of people, to the Chinese, to the Malays, and to the Arabs. And uh, they were very successful, and uh, many were found in Sumatra. And then I found these very psychedelic batiks. And where are these from? I managed to buy some in uh, Patani. And then I saw some also in Palembang. But when I went to the source, which is Chiribon, I never saw any. So these were specifically made for export from Chiribon for the Malay market. It's very psychedelic. And the purple and green was the color scheme. This, this I found in Song Club. And then Batik Grisik. It's also in Java, in East Java. It's a Batik town, but no longer produces Batik. So if you want to find Batik Grisik, you can only find it in Sumatra. It's very popular uh, with the Sumatra Malays. And they ordered a lot of it. And uh, it's usually in this color scheme, blue and red and cream. So these are different Batik Grisiks. Very geometric uh, pattern, mo almost like a Mughal Persian pattern. And these are copying Indian chins patterns, also found in Sumatra. These are copying Indian chins, Bambiru, Bambiru Umu with purple. And then from Pachitan, also you have batiks for the Malay market. I found many uh, batik Pachitan uh, from Java, Central Java, in uh, Sumatra. Then we go to Central Java, in Jogja and Surakarta. These standard uh, uh, court textiles with the Paranusa patterns were very popular with the Malay community, not only in Sumatra, but also in Malaysia. So this is a set from Selangor. Uh, I purchased this uh, uh, baju, uh, sorry, uh, this kebaya. Uh, it's not a Peranakan kebaya because it has the crescent and the stars embroidered on it. So it's typically for a Malay lady. And I bought it from uh, a Malay lady in Selangor uh, together with the sarong. So this is the way they would dress in Malaysia. And the Japanese princess would be dressed this way. As you can see here, the same pattern of the uh, parangrusa, the small parangrusa pattern. But they have 
these velvet black baju uh, kabayas. And in the 50s and 60s, in Saloma's period, this was very popular. Uh, Salom Saloma would love one of these uh, Javanese uh, solo or jokja parangusa panties. And some of them with flowers. Then now we go to the types, which is, I think, very interesting for me. Uh, we go quickly into Batik Basurek, which is this, the Batik with uh, Arabic calligraphy on it, uh, used for funerals or weddings. The red ones will be used for funerals and also for clothing for children as a protective uh, covering, as you can see on this uh, vest of a young boy. And I think you can see the creative mindset of the Malay people through these textiles, because every piece uh, uses the same wording, sometimes there's a shahada in it, uh, but in a different format. Uh, and there are hundreds of different formats uh, I have. I have maybe uh, 150 of these, and every one is a different pattern. You can see it's very unusual. Uh, they were made in different places, uh, Chiribon, uh, Jambi, and Benkulu. These are the main places that produce them but mostly for the Sumatran market. You see very little in Chiribon used by the, the Javanese. Actually, you can only see them in the court, but you see quite a lot in Sumatra. See, this is in the court in, in the Karaton Kasepuhan, uh, one of the palaces in Chiribon, and you can see one of the Batik Basurat hanging as a flag in the background of the throne. And I found a similar example in Kelantan. This is Kelantan Islamic Museum. There's one flag exactly the same but in red hanging there. So it's for the Malay market. Yes. And these are the beautiful examples you can see that they use for Ike Kapala, especially when men go and fight or they do a silat uh, uh, performance and practice. They wear Ike Kapala with a batik calligraphy uh, or batik basurat to protect them. It's a form of protection. This has the words of the four prophets of Allah there. Um, this piece. And here you have these few pieces. Uh, I was very happy. Most of my pieces I found in uh, Jambi. And I found in uh, Palembang. But uh, I found some in Tringanu. And I was so happy to find these two pieces, very fine pieces in Tringanu which I believe came from Cheribon. But when I went to Leiden and I gave a lecture at the Leiden Res uh, Textile Research Center, I found that I found exactly a, a skirt with exactly the same pattern as my batik pasture that I bought in Tringanu. And I said, what's going on? How come they have Tringanu textiles? And my friend who was with me said, oh no, John, this is made in Holland. I said, no, it can't be. It has Islamic script. He says, yes, the Dutch made imitation batiks for the Malay market. And I, I still couldn't believe it. And then she told me the story. In the, in the 1930s and 40s, when uh, the uh, demand for batik became great, uh, the Dutch tried to uh, get involved in the market by producing uh, printed, wax printed, machine printed batiks, and they were very successful in doing it, and the Malays and Indonesians were importing a lot of it. And this skirt was actually made for young boys in this island called um, Marken, a small island not far from Amsterdam. Now this is a very conservative Christian island, uh, but they believe in spirits, and they believe that the spirits will take away your young boy unless you dress them as a girl. So all the young boys were dressed in colorful aprons. You see here? And some of the aprons used this batik basura, which was produced in Holland. Uh, uh, this is the person who invented it in 1846. He opened a company to produce imitation batiks uh, for the Malay market and later when uh, Indonesia banned it, they exported it to Africa. So these are two pieces that I purchased, recently made. The company still exists. It's over 200 year company. It's called Vilsco. 
Okay, but they are not cheap and they are hard to come by because uh, they make only uh, four meters at a time of one particular design and then when it's sold, they don't repeat it until after a long period of time. And these Malay style batiks, which were popular with the Malays, are now popular in Africa. They are being sold in Africa now by the Dutch. So that was very new to me. And this is from Cherry Bonds. The red ones are more rare. I have a one. This is over 100 years old. Uh, I found this in Palembang, but it was made in Cherry Bond. And it was used as a lalangin. See this, uh, because many of the old ones have damage on the corners. So we can know that probably at the wedding, it was used like this. This was a recent uh, Bukit ceremony that attended, and this in Makassar. And this is how it was used in the old days. Or they were used as little boys' vests to protect uh, a young boy from getting sick. These are the other patterns. And this is a very unusual one called Batik Bas Basura Siam Malam. The both pattern is different on, diff on each side. One is dark and the other one is uh, light. And another category is the Batik Wayang Kulin. So people ask me, how do I know that these are from Malay people? The Indonesians use Batik Wayang Kulin. So when I checked and compared, there's one big difference. Can you guess what it is? If you actually look at the textile carefully, all these characters have names. The Sumatran Malays were not as familiar as Kulit, as with the Wayang Kulit stories as the Javanese. So when the Javanese made it for the Malays, they added the name so they remember who the characters are. So these, the ones with the names, are usually the ones for the Malay market in Sumatra, not for the Javanese. This is a rare sarong um, from the 1950s and 60s. This is a Lendam. You can, can you see the name here? Anoman, meaning Hanuman, right? This is Hanuman. And there's, uh, there's a name here, and there's a name somewhere here, I cannot hear. And these also were made of um, Selendang and uh, uh, Gendongans for carrying the babies with the Batik. These were made in Makalongan for the Malay market. Most of these were found in Sumatra, but you don't see them in, in Makalongan. And then you have this, also a Batik Wayangkulit, I found in Comorin in South Sumatra. Now these are the Japanese, uh, the Javanese types. Most of the Javanese types were made for the Dutch for export. Uh, very seldom you see the Javanese using it. This is in Trotter Museum. It's a fantastic uh, wayang kulit batik. But I don't think you see Indonesian Japanese wearing this type. It's not in their tradition. Um, and then you can see it's, it's made, the batik with wayang kulit, it's made for the European Catholic market. This is a church in Jakarta, Catholic church, where you can see a, a Mary of Assumption wearing a batik, a baju panjang here, with batik wayang kulit. And these were all exported to um, Holland and found in the Dutch museums. This is a recent one that I discovered in the uh, Atono collection in Jakarta. It's also probably made for the Dutch, but you can see they're very fine and dynamic. This is a detail from it. And this is one by the Javanese, not by the Malays, because there are no names on it. Okay. And this is the traditional Mayan bullet they call um, chip toning, worn by men in their 60s. Only wise men can wear it because all the stories they know by heart and they can tell the children about it. When the children point, oh, what's the story in this? So it's all batik to this, but every square is different. And another category is batik bokchan. It's the silk batiks that the Malays love. It was made in Rembang and Joanna, these two places in the north central uh, Java. And the people who loved it were the Sumatrans in Minangkabau, the Sumatran Malays in Minangkabau, and also in Bali. So these were the two places that exported them. And you can see in all pictures that these are the Minang Kabao people wearing the uh, Nokchan. You can see the way it's draped is obviously silk. 
Um, and this is the Mina Kabao Baju uh, Kanjang and Baju Kurong using uh, Kain Lok Chan. And this, my friend in Mina, she still wears it, her grandmother's uh, silk Lok Chan. Lok means Lü, uh, green, and Chan means silk Chan. So it means green silk uh, batiks or cloth. And they say that the cloth, the silk comes from Shantung province and was popular with the Javanese. Uh, but not used by the Javanese, mostly by the Balinese and the Malays. Uh, this is uh, in Solok, in South Sumatra, where the men also use it as uh, a scarf. Here, these are the types that they use. And then you come to Batik Nitik, which is an Indo-Arab Batik. The Arabs were very famous for doing Nitik. You know what Nitik is, right? It's the dotting. Dots. So they carve little pieces of wood in rectangular and triangular shapes. And they would use this and they would go and dot the whole batik like this. And sometimes it takes six months to finish dotting one. But they were very good at it and were very expensive. So only the European, Indo European ladies who had clients for them would buy from the Hindu Arabs. And there were people who copied it, but the quality is not as good. So, how do I know that the Malay is like this? Because in my travels in the Malay world, I managed to go to a small place called Pankalambun. Has anyone heard of Pankalambun? Anyone? I've never heard of it, any, but I found out it was a Malay kingdom related to the court of Bajamasin, which is also Malay. And they had a palace, a wooden palace from the uh, 1890s. So I entered the palace, and I found a cabinet full of textiles worn by the seven princesses, uh, daughters of the sultan. So I took, I photographed every textiles and I found batik knitting there. And I also found some in Sumatra. So I can confirm that it was a style that the Malays liked. Okay. And you can see that it is not, it, even though it's made in Kalongan by the Indo Arabs, it was made in the north village of uh, Krak Yat. Uh, it's made for the Malay market because of this Islamic symbols here. Can you see the star and the moon? And but the design is done by a Hindu Dutch. She did the design and she asked an Hindu Arab to do the pattern, the waxing and the printing, and then she sold it to the Malay. So designed by Hindu Dutch, done by Arabs and then sold to the Malays. So this is the one I found in Pangalampu. Can you see the dotting? See, these are all done by little dots by hand. It's called knitting. Okay. And this is a fine one um, from my collection. And this is from Peter Lee's collection in Singapore. These are one by the Dutch, you can tell by the kabaya here, it's a Dutch style kabaya. The, the Peranakan Nonya kabaya is usually pointed at the end. Um, and this is the Malay style. Uh, you can see here the nitik is here. Can you see the nitik? The dotting. And it, it suits the Malay taste because of the very geometric patterns and the subdued colors. And this is nitik with Prada means a yellow or gold leaf on top. So they will dot it in batik and then dot it in gold. Okay. And the next uh, category is Prada or Telepo, where after they do the batik pattern, they would um, mix a glue in, in Java. Uh, they use a glue made out of uh, powdered fish bone. In Malaysia, they use alum uh, resin from a tree to make the glue. And what they do is they put the glue on the, the arm and they take a chop, for example, the shape of a flower. They put the glue on the arm and then they put it on the textile and then they put the gold leaf on the textile and they secure it by pasting it on. And then when it's dry, they, they, they use a brush to wipe off the, the ones that, the, the places that are not uh, attached. So this is the Prada technique, which is very expensive. And it's used by the Sumatra Malays because they believe they came from the land of gold. It was called uh, Subarana Dipa, um, the land of gold. And 
the Malays of Sumatra were famous for conspicuous consumption. During the weddings, if you go to a Sumatran wedding, the ladies and the men will be decked in gold. And they have many necklaces, and they will show off their textiles by piling it up. Stacks of textiles, they have a table long like this, and they'll stack up all their textiles to show their wealth. And then, you know, people will give money to them, and then they'll open all the packets of money and put a light and count it in front of everyone to show how wealthy they are. So this is the style of uh, Sumatran Malays. And by showing this gold, uh, they can show um, their wealth. And this tradition comes much earlier from the Indian Sambagis. These are Indian textiles, but they put gold leaf on the Indian textiles. And you can see it's only on one section. Why? Because when they roll up the kind of bus, the rolled up section, if it's gold, it will be all crushed. So it's only the section that is not uh, rolled up. It's shown in the front here. Um, sorry. This is another one, there's a detail here to show you how fine it is. The gold, you can see the piece outside. And then this is how it's worn in the wedding. Uh, I got this from Facebook and the, the faces were blocked, so I don't know who it is. But the um, a Malay wedding in Palembang, where the bride uses it's a rare photo. This uh, you can see it's glowing, it's a Prada on Batik. And this is from my collection. Beautiful pieces and in a Malay wedding, this would be how it looks. Even the baju kurong and the selendang is all prada. And you have a baju uh, uh, kebaya pendek with uh, prada sarong. And these are the new ones where it's no longer gold leaf. They take gold paint and paint over the batik. So it's much cheaper, more affordable. And the gold paint is secure, you can actually wash it. But in the old days, the kind product, you cannot, water cannot go near it. It will dissolve the gold. And this is very different from the Prada used by the Japanese and the clothing of the Japanese. You can see the Japanese were a, a different uh, costume style. And this is uh, the wedding at the Pako Alam that attended in the south of Georgia. Um, and you can see this is all Prada here traditional style, but it's more subdued, not as brightly colored as the Sumatran Malay ones. And then there's another type of batik called batik Batawi. The Batawi people are the Sudanese people in uh, West Java, and they were mixed with the Dutch, the Indians, and the Chinese, and the Malays. And they had their own culture, but they were part of the Malay world, and they live in Batavia. And they had their own cuisine. And the types of batik they have are very bright colored. Uh, and they used to make a living from selling copra, a lot of coconuts they had uh, grown around the, the port of Batavia. And uh, these are the types of batiks they produce with the elephants uh, dancing among the coconut trees. And different color schemes. And the way they put their pachorobong is on the sides and at the bottom. And this is another type where you have uh, ayam, chickens here. Um, and this type, I'm not sure where it really comes from. It's called Bati Ayan de, de Lape. There's a Malay song called Ayan de Lape, I think. Uh, the running away chicken. And it's a very popular in the Minang area. And I found these in Padang, in Minang Kabao. Um, and these were batik and hand painting. So what they did do is, they take a cloth and they wax it, the major batik pattern. So for example, a flower. So they wax the flower and then they put it in the, the for example, the purple dye. So you have purple background with white flowers. Then you, they use color paint to hand paint the colors in. So a bit like the batik tulis of Malaysia today. And these are examples of this batik, ayan de lape. And then you have batiks that I don't know where they're from. They, I think they're done with stenciling. They, put, they cut out uh, paper cuts, they put it on the cloth, and then they paint over it. And this, this is batik kotak. Uh, it's very interesting because when Asa Aziz wrote her book, uh, she said that Bati Kota actually got its name from an old man who sold batiks that had 
will put into boxes because they are so soft, right? They can be folded and they will put in boxes and given as presents in boxes. So the box, because there's no quota pattern on here, so it comes from the history of it's being sold in boxes. So the box is the quota. But then uh, a new researcher came up with uh, um, the theory that in the 1930s, um, the, the son of Haji Che Su, uh, two sons, Muhammad Saleh and Muhammad Yusuf, they invented silk screen batiks. So the silk screens were in the shape of squares, kota. So they call those silk screen batik kota. And in fact, it's not really batik, they are in fact silk screens. So uh, what is the origin of this batik kota? Let's investigate. Okay, so these are come uh, in different colors and quite amazing because you know, you don't know where they actually made. Maybe they were made in Kelantan by these two brothers, but they were definitely catering for the Malay market because of the motifs. So you can see here, the motif is what? Pulasan, yes. Okay. And here, this motif, is it a Malay motif? Uh, many people say, oh, it's a Peranakan motif because Peranakans use Ipans, right? These are Victorian glass flower vases imported from England and also in, in silver. But when you go to Malay weddings, they are used. You see them in Malay weddings and Malay homes. So this silver piece was found in a Singapore Malay home. It's now in the Malay Heritage Center. And these pink ones are similar to the ones here, made of Cambrian glass. Uh, it's, you can see here, this is the same ipam here, ipam here, and there's one probably here. They use in Malay weddings. This is a Malay wedding in Singapore. And uh, the first one I found was in the Kelantan Museum. And also, I thought it was a Peranakan motif, but it's shared by the Malays as well. So I was so happy to find two. So I now have two of these in my collection, uh, catering for the Malay people. And how were they worn? You can see perhaps in the hot days, the Malay women would wear these because they're thin and silky and cool. So I asked my Malay friends today, do you wear silk sarongs? They say, never. We never wear silk sarongs. I said, really? But we have these silk sarongs. They said, no lah, we don't wear it like this. We wear it like this, as kalubos, because it's soft and then it says, it's a hair covering. So uh, I'm not sure if it was worn um, this way because we never know in those old days they could have worn it. Maybe today they don't wear it as silk sarongs. But uh, if you look at old pictures, they were actually used as kalubos. Can you see this pattern? It's almost the same. And the border is very similar to the border here. And the way it drapes looks more like silk than the cotton. This is stiffer here. So it's probably a bate kota, silk of Japanese habotai so it's very fine. They call it habotai, it means light as feather. Okay, so it's a very fine Japanese silk. And here you can see the same. Uh, can you see the pattern? It's a tree here. And this I have a tree here too. So it probably is also a batikota. Now, where is batikota really from? Um, Peter Lee who has written a book on Sarong Kabaya, told me that he found a reference, and this is from his book, and uh, it shows that Japan was the source of imitation batiks of poor quality. A case heard in Singapore courts in 1934 provides an insight into aspects of this commerce. Utram and Company, a shop in Arab Street in Singapore, was accused by the police of selling batik sarongs under the house label of Chakuda Lumba racing horse bread and were marked fast color, meaning that the color doesn't run, meaning it's fast dye. Uh, when in fact they were not, when people brought them home, the colors ran, okay? And one sample was sent to the laboratory which confirmed the acquisition. The proprietor revealed that he had bought 784 pieces from Kobe, Japan. Are they from Japan? Yes. Because on most of mine, I find Japanese script. Although it's also Chinese characters, but it's written more in a Japanese style. The kanji, Japanese kanji. So I can confirm that these came from Kobe, Japan, and only lasted until after the, until the end, uh, 
before the war, uh, 1930s and 40s. And most of them, when you see them, the color has run. You actually cannot wash them. I think they are cheap sarongs for daily wear as kalubos. And then after you use it for a while, you just throw them away and buy new ones. And that's why very few have lasted in good condition. So I decided to collect as many as I could in good condition because it records a time and a fashion trend at that time. Uh, if I don't collect it, it will be lost. And we do not know that at one time the Malays liked these Japanese uh, uh, imitation batiks. And these are other imitation batiks. These are prints I found in Sumatra. Perhaps also, it's not on silk, it's on cotton, but perhaps also inspired by the Japanese. And, and then these uh, were found in Trenganu in the palace, and this is in Kelantan. And probably there was a print factory making Javanese batiks in this style, uh, because the color scheme is exactly the same. And then the printed batiks in Thailand. In Thailand, when you go and see, when you look at this, it doesn't look Thai, right? It looks Malay, but the whole of South Thailand, they speak Malay, and they have Malayu festival, and they have uh, Mat Yong, and they have Wayang Kulit, and all the Malay food that you eat is very different from mainland Thailand. Um, so they were part of the Lanka Sukha Empire that uh, spoke Malay and dressed uh, Malay and uh, followed Malay customs. And then you have the Samuta from Kelantan all the way up to South Thailand. It's not Batik, they are prints, but some people call them Batiks as well. And they're used for headdresses. Uh, for the men and shawls for the women. And when you go, sometimes in the marketplace, you can have a full selection of them. Okay. Now, batiks, the last category is batiks by color. So what I've given you is uh, some notes. So when you go out and you see the batiks, if you see these categories, you just put a tick to confirm that you've seen it. And, and you can understand the different categories better. So batik umu. So when I went to Palembang to the museum, they said, "Oh, ini batik umu, ini batik umu." I said, "What on earth is batik umu?" These made in Papalongan for the Papalongan Chinese, but the Malays happen to like it. So many of them were found in uh, Malay kampongs in Sumatra, and these beautiful ones uh, with it's all tulis, including the swastika. It's all batik tulis. It's a blue and purple in color, or brownish purple. And these, this batik umu showing durian pattern on the cylinder. And batik umu, Indo-European. Okay, these were famous, uh, the stories of around the world in 80 days were very popular in those days. And comic books were all over Indonesia, and they copied it and made it, and the Malays liked it. And you know, the, the Muslim, uh, tenant about not using uh, figural motifs on uh, your batiks or on, on your household items uh, wasn't much followed at that time. Uh, you find all kinds of animals and human beings in these batiks. Uh, this is around the world in 80 days. And then you see the Lombok War. Um, uh, it's very interesting because this is a 1930s photo and this is a photo I just took in Makassar in 2019, and someone was wearing a shirt with the motif of Batik, uh, the Lombok War. And what happened in the Lombok War was um, Bali, the Karanjan Sound Empire, attacked Lombok and conquered part of Lombok. But the Balinese were Hindu, and the Lombok Sasa people were Muslim, and they didn't like the, the, the domination of the Balinese, so they called the, the Dutch to help. So after much struggle, the Dutch uh, forced, killed a lot of the, the Balinese, and they forced the palace people to come out. Uh, all the palace people came out, and about 80 of the palace uh, royal family killed themselves in front of the Dutch. They didn't want to be shamed by the Dutch people. So it was a very famous war that the Dutch were very proud to win. So the Hindu-Dutch people printed it on their batiks, and it became popular all over Indonesia, especially with the Malays. The Malays didn't know anything about this war. They just liked the pattern and they liked the heroes. And the Hindu Dutch were wearing it and the Malays saw it and they adopted it. So we found a lot of these. And um, 
It's uh, very interesting because when I was preparing this PowerPoint, somebody came up with this batik and said, would you like it? I said, of course. So I bought it. Uh, it's a Padi Sore uh, uh, Batik Kalingan of the Lombok War. Um, and then the blue-green uh, color is also much liked in uh, Sumatra. And you have this Safra. It's very interesting that the Malays were very curious about Western style uh, culture and they adopted it in different ways. It means that they used it on a tablecloth, they had the fork and spoon. They looked at the fork and spoon, but they ate with their hands. Okay. And this is how it's used. Okay. Quite interesting. And then the orange green. Uh, Batiks of Akalungan were very popular in Sumatra. These are very popular, orange colors. This is how it was used. And then the multicolor batiks, I will go through quickly, also favored in, by the Sumatran Malays. And then we have a new batiks uh, done in Sarawak, new areas in Malaysia, uh, using traditional patterns. There were no batiks before in Sarawak, and now we have and they can make them into shirts. Uh, and uh, this is Sham Abu Bakr. He's using traditional Islamic patterns in a more modern way. And then you have in Jambi, they use Batik calligraphy, or Batik Basuret in a more modern way. Um, and then Ruz Kahara uses it for his uh, household wear and for also uh, modern wear. And uh, Tunku Marina in her pink jambu uses batik to this. So the modern batiks is also batiks from the Malay world. Uh, but I think when you create batiks from the Malay world, you should not leave your tradition. In batiks like this, I do not see, uh, it's batik technique done by Malaysians, but I do not see any connection with the past. So it's, you know, for a living tradition, it has to connect with the past and have something uh, innovative. So it's uh, tradition and innovation combined together. But when you have something like this, I think it has been cut. Um, and then Bin House in Jakarta, she understands tradition, so she uses traditional patterns with modern techniques. This is the Indian Kanta stitch that she created with um, with uh, her batik to this here on silk. And this is also batik, but she stitches it to make it more three-dimensional. And this is batik on gauze. Or organza. And also, we have contemporary batik paintings. Um, a lot can be uh, produced uh, um, from uh, adopting from the past and using past traditions to create something new. Um, so, my conclusion here is <clears throat> I have to uh, uh, remind you that this is the first time I'm addressing the topic of batiks for the Malay world. Nobody has uh, done this before. So a lot of the things that I postulated needs further research. Yes, um, that's one point. The second point is, if this concept is misunderstood, it can be dangerous. Because what I'm doing here is you're looking at me telling you what the Malays like and what Malay taste is. But this is not a definitive taste because the taste is the taste of passion which changes every minute and it's different in different places. So in the old days, you know, you wouldn't be caught wearing a pillow blana with a sarong on the outside. Now it doesn't matter. It, it changes all the time. In, in the old days, women didn't have to wear tudong. Now most women wear tudong. So fashion changes. There's no fixed uh, fashion. So what I showed you what the Malays like was during a certain period only. You cannot use it to say this is Malay taste. Do you get me? So what I'm trying to say here is I'm showing you what the Malay mindset is. So have you seen what the Malay mindset is? It's amalgamating nature of Malay people. They can adopt different uh, inspirations from different areas. It's the hybridity of 
the Malay mind. They can uh, have appreciate something from the Dutch, something from the Japanese, and put it together as as one. Okay. So this is what I'm talking about. That uh, Malays as a whole and themselves uh, are not a fixed ethnicity. Every Malay comes from mixed race. Can you tell me one Malay that has, um, you know, no, you know, most Malays when you ask them, they have a Javanese father or they have a, a, a Chinese mother. It's, it's all mixed. And this is the nature, the mindset of the Malays. Uh, it, it's not a, a, a group of people that can be isolated and they, they, they feel more comfortable when they adopt other cultures and they appreciate it. Uh, it's like um, in, in China as well. Uh, there's no one fixed Chinese fashion. You know, people say, oh, what is Chinese fashion? Oh, the chong sa or the qi pao. But was that Chinese? That's Manchurian. And now in China, they're against the qi pao. They're into han fu. Han fu means the long robes of the Han dynasty. So you see people on the streets in China wearing these long diaphanous robes. Uh, and they call it the Chinese style, and it changes. But you can see the mindset of the Chinese means that they like, their mindset is they like to use different traditions in a modern setting. Um, so I'm showing you what the mindset is more than what the taste is. So that when you see this mindset, you can appreciate it. And what else can you see is that this mindset uses the whole of the Malay world the whole cultural heritage, not just in, from one area. So different areas share with each other, different areas make batiks for each other. So it's an interconnected region that is vast. And my third point is, because it's so vast, we can draw from it. It becomes an inspiration, a bigger inspiration and a, on a wider base that can help us continue this vibrant living culture of the Malay people. Uh, so, in my other slide, I want to show you some examples. <clears throat> okay, this is a recent slide of my friend in the middle, Chet Su. Um, where, what she's wearing is the Malay mindset I'm talking about. She's wearing a Bugis Baju Bodo with a Malay Tudo Manto from Riau and a Bugis headdress. Very few people have the audacity as she to mix and match like she does. I'm not sure if it flows nicely or elegantly, uh, but it's the Malay mindset. It might not work, but it's acceptable. Okay, then you see this slide. Uh, this is with the dancer Azanin. We went to a party in Singapore. She's dressed in traditional Baju Malay. But if you look at Azanin's background, she's because as a dancer, she had to perform in various, various countries in the Malay world. She did her research uh, in, in Makassar. You know, I went to all these remote places in Duwu, and she said, oh, I've been to those places. And she's been to Cambodia, she's danced for the king of Cambodia, she's been to Japan, she's been all over. So she understands the wider aspect of the Malay culture and heritage. So in this dress, she uses a selendang kain lima. But her kain lima is from Cambodia. It's charm from Cambodia. So I'm, I'm saying that because we have this bigger cultural heritage, we can use it and we're still traditional and yet innovative in a subtle and elegant way. And this is what I hope I can inspire and I can show people so that they can use this as a base, do more research on the textiles, not just on uh, um, Malay Peninsula, but the whole of the Malay Empire. And to create even more interesting and uh, dynamic works in Batik and in art. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Thank you very much for this enlightening speech. And, uh, yeah, very educational, very cognitive, very, uh, you know, impressive. 
John, would you like uh, to share with us uh, the dress that you're wearing uh, in the party and, and tell us about it a bit? Yeah. Okay, um, actually I'm trying to do um, what uh, Azani is doing, okay? Uh, in, in Malaysia, uh, batiks are homeware. When you go to a wedding, you usually wear socket. It's more uh, respected. But in Java, batiks are worn in the court. Okay, so what I'm trying to do is, um, I'm showing that you can actually use uh, sarong batik as a something. In, instead of just going uh, always in, in socket. As, as the model here, can you stand up and show people? He's wearing a jambi batik as a something, and the selenda is a su sutra uh, selenda, uh, also from jambi. Okay, so you can dress like this. It's still within the Malay tradition, but it's using a new concept of using batik for uh, important ceremonies. You can wear this for a wedding, for example. Okay, so I'm also wearing batik jambi. You can see. This is a basida and the saro, I have the pachoro bone as a bed. Um, model is Norman, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, can I open the floor uh, for questions and answers? Uh, if you have any, please uh, plug your hand and just click on the microphone. Anyone? Please do. Yes, uh, from? We have several, yeah. Uh, my name is Zekai Ali, and I'm uh, a pensioner. Um, and, and also an adjunct professor at Atoma here at this moment. Um, your, your talk has been very, very good, uh, uh, Mr. Young. I have, I have a few things I want to ask. Uh, not really questions, but ruminations. Um, as of 19th century, 20th century, we began to have these nation states. We have Indonesia, we have us, we have Singapore, we have... And as we go on, there's always that pressure to assert some kind of identity, some kind of national identity. So, firstly, we we have our, we, we wrote the constitution, we drew our, our borders, we have the national language, we have, uh, we have national religion, uh, to signify that we are what we are. Suddenly we have this batik, which is transnational. You, you go to examples from Cambodia, from Indonesia, especially from Java, from Sumatra, and so on which seems to eliminate national borders. Whereas uh, art historians or cultural historians would insist on some kind of cultural identity which is unique to us. So my, I have this problem trying to resolve this. Uh, how would a Cambodian design Differ from us, and how would our design differ from those in in Sumatra? So, Malaysian artists have uh, have find ways in which to express this. Uh, we have people like uh, Chua Tenteng, we have people like uh, Ismail Marusin, who use the body as a medium to paint pictures. Mm -hmm. So they become batik painting, as opposed to others who rely primarily on, on floral or, or, or geometrical designs. So I wonder whether, whether we, by adopting uh, a technique like the Western uh, oil painting or watercolor painting, and making images, whether they would qualify it as a statement of natural of national identity, or whether it is just a passing fact, like you say, uh, but it is a, it's a fashion. 
So once you use it as a medium of painting, it is also a fashion. They would go out of style at any time. So, so it's not a question actually, it's just I wonder if you could illuminate a little bit of this. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Do we have another uh, one? Can, can, we, can we allow for two or three? Yes, sir. Can I post a question in Basam Ali? Do you take people Sure, sir. Sure. I hope I can understand. <laughs> uh, all right. Jadi saya dapat lambat tadi, saya tak 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 berapa tak berapa ikuti lah. Saya dapati yang yang daripada wacana uh, profesor, saya dapati yang dunia batik ni, kreatif batik ni di dalam dunia Melayu kononnya nampaknya dia ni bersumber berasal dari Sumatera saja kan dan ataupun di Jakarta di Jawa betul abid abid this batik the the origin the generate is being generated primarily in Sumatera and Java is it true uh, i show you the chart is uh, 50% in Java 25% in Sumatra, 25% in Malaysia. So my question is, what about the other regions of uh, the Malay world? Have they also produce party? Malay, 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 Malay. What, about, what about the other regions of the Malay world? Or just party only originated in uh, specifically? There is, but very minimal. Huh? Very, very minimal. Yeah. Ah. And I think was, and in the Malay world is basically it's a feudal, feudal world, you know. So I don't think uh, that the feudal culture can, 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 can encourage more, more vibrancy, more creativity in batik design. Thank you. Okay, uh, the last question about the Malay world is a feudal world. Uh, it's, uh, but today, uh, you'll find that uh, it doesn't work as a feudal world because uh, the modern Malays are reconnecting and in a different way than the past. Uh, for example, uh, in Kelantan and uh, Trengganu, they have many um, uh, connections. They have like Quran recitations, right? Uh, competitions and they exchange. They have groups coming to Kelantan and groups going to uh, Patani and going to Champa. And, uh, the people are doing it on a more, in, in the past it was natural that we were one, but now it's a more assertive effort to reconnect because of the realization of the necessity that we cannot be isolated. But this is only among a few people. The rest of the people are unaware that the connection is necessary. Uh, and to your point, it's very interesting because it was raised when Peter Lee gave a lecture uh, raising the same points that I did, and someone raised your point. Um, the cultural identity that we try so hard to make, uh, now with what I said, makes it difficult. How do you uh, uh, make a cultural identity? And when you do, it suddenly changes, everything changes, it, it, because it's not constant. Uh, so what I'm saying is, uh, to see the bigger picture, uh, the broader picture, because when we try to limit ourselves to one cultural identity, then we cut uh, out all the outside uh, resources. Um, and does that mean you lose your identity? Uh, no, because you have that mindset, the inner soul, which is still Malay, so what is this in the soul? The nature of hybridity. Maybe if you investigate in Cambodia, they are not as diverse as the Malays. Maybe French, they have French influence, they have Laotian, it's a different diversity. But they cannot see themselves as isolated as Cambodia only. They have to see what built up their culture, which was um, the other uh, countries Thailand and Laos and Burma play a big role in their culture. So I'm, I'm saying that they should see in a bigger area. And it's a different role than 
is a different white culture than the, the, the Malay culture. The Malays had, you know, uh, 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 a different group of people that they connected with. So I'm saying to look at the group and how we connected with the group as a cultural identity in, on a bigger scale. Okay, uh, I think we can have another five minutes uh, if you have. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my name is Murat from East Tech uh, Thank you for a splendid membership uh, of uh, Martin in the Middle World. Uh, coming from the first point, uh, the first uh, the person who asked about Martin uh, and the Asian state. Uh, yeah, you, you're right in terms of uh, the design, the, 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 the motive, the, the, the art itself, concepts, models. But in Malaysia, it seems that after independence, Malaysia becomes a post colonial state, there is a problem of uh, cultural identity. And here there's a problem of Batik identity in Malaysia. When the image of uh, Malaysian Batik is uh, Evolved. Uh, I find it problematic in terms of how, I, uh, as, as uh, a citizen of this country, as a citizen of the Malay world, uh, trying to engage with with party as as perceived as Malaysian party. How would you, would you see the reaction of 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 party uh, or the image of Malaysian party, or should there be an image of Malaysian party specific particularly, or should party be? Uh, cut, cut across uh, uh, nationalism, uh, cutting across uh, political boundaries. Uh, I I feel that um, the Malaysian batik um, creation and production has not really been challenged, as the Indonesians have been challenged, because there are so many producers in Indonesia, the competition is so high that they come up with better and better things. In Malaysia, uh, there are not that many people producing batiks. And so, uh, using batik as a textile to identify you has not, is not there yet. And I think uh, the start of this uh, presentation is to show that we have this cultural heritage. Uh, can we use batiks in a broader way, uh, in terms of uh, social hierarchy, and in terms of uh, uh, different functions and ceremonies. Uh, can we use batiks in terms of uh, different levels of quality, which we haven't reached yet? And so I think um, we need uh, organizations like the Craft Council uh, to gather together people to determine what is the goal to get an identity and whether we can encourage artisans and artists to work towards that goal. Right now it's scattered. It's, there's no one mind to think or no, no group of people to think how we can use it in uh, a way that is uh, able to show the world that Malaysians can also do batiks of quality and batiks that are wearable and batiks that are fashionable. Not enough. Yeah. One of the things I mentioned in Indonesia, batik sellers are very literate. They can, they can invoke the soul of the batik to you as a consumer. Yes. Whereas in Malaysia, when you go to shops in Kranta Kranta, when you ask the seller, they don't do anything, they just sell. So again, I think there's a problem of batik literacy among sellers to educate buyers. How do you consume batik if the sellers themselves do not know what they're selling? Well, there's a different tradition because in Malaysia, batiks are just wearable cloths. Whereas in Indonesia, many of the batiks are sacred with a long history. You know, for example, um, I have this batik in my house that are just stars. You know, but the story is about, uh, <laughs> is, is, is the black colored batik with brown stars and it's used for weddings. So I'm saying, why are they used for weddings? And then the batik teller will say, oh, there's a king who loved his wife a lot and then later he found a more beautiful woman and then he left her, you know, alone. And then she was so sad 
and every night she saw the star, she started to cry. And then she said, in my loneliness, I, the only thing I can do is use the batik to paint a star. So every night she'll paint these meticulous stars. And in the end, the cloth became a beautiful cloth of stars. And one day her husband came to visit her. And he was surprised. How come you made this beautiful batik? She said, because I'm thinking of you all the time. And he was so touched, he went back to her. You know, there's a lot of these wonderful stories that make you appreciate the batik more, right? And, and I agree with you, it's not used in uh, Malaysia because there's not this tradition. So, can we be inspired by the Indonesian tradition and create batiks with a story? You know, that we can share and then can we educate the kids with it? I know uh, batik producers now making batiks for children so that kids can appreciate and then batiks are taught in school, so they appreciate what it takes to make a meticulous batik, all that work. So I think organizations should, you know, like Crown Council should start you know, working on things like that. Um, yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. Uh, very interesting. Uh, do we have class anymore before we close up the session? I, I, I was with John and John showed me uh, three pieces of batik cloth, I think, three or two pieces. One in Klapa, Cambodia, one from Java. And he showed me similarities of patterns uh, in three different designs, but they have similarities. And then John talked about the influence of uh, Sri Vijaya uh, Kingdom in those days, that perhaps, you know, there's a um, transmission or assimilation of uh, images and icon and design in, in different different parts of uh, Sri Vijaya Kingdom. Yeah, if, if I still remember what you said. So meaning that uh, there are a lot, lot of opportunities for people, young people, to do research. You know, in this batik um, a circle. If you are interested, we have few students here, and we are looking for students to do master's and PhD in batik. Uh, not necessarily, you know, batik Malaysia, but we're talking about batik Nusantara because it it, it transcends the border eh, between Malaysia and Indonesia and also perhaps parts of Philippines, South of, uh, Th Thailand and also Vietnam. Okay, uh, before we close the session, uh, can we have John to wrap up the session and then after this we're going to have, uh, we're going to go outside and see the exhibition of yours and then perhaps some friend can, can help. Okay, just yes. one last thing on this picture. Yeah. Yes. Uh, when you see Dato Azani in Sarong Kabaya, and with a Cambodian Lima. You wouldn't think she's Cambodian. It is Malay, but she used a Cambodian Lima. So what would the Cambodian wear? They wear the Sampot and the Malay, the, the Cambodian uh, blouse, which is different from the Sao Kabaya. And they could wear a Malay Lima. Maybe that makes the Cambodian identity. So give you that for thought. Thank you.